There is another process called electron capture, which is a type of radioactive decay where you have a nucleus with a high number of positively charged protons. This positive charge inside the atomic nucleus, especially when it comes to heavy atoms, creates a strong attraction force on the electron present in the shell, pulling it in. When it is pulled in, it transforms into a neutron. This means you have reduced the charge in the nucleus, which wants to stabilize. This is electron capture. This process is significant in nuclear physics. Let's imagine this. In the nucleus, there are protons and an electron. And there is also a shell. We will say this is the K shell and this is the L shell. Now the electron was attracted and entered the proton to transform into a neutron, occupying the space where the electron was standing, which was stable and waiting. Now that space is empty. Here, in this particular process, the electron must drop from a higher energy level to fill the energy gap that has formed. So, when the electron drops, what does it give off? It emits a photon of characteristic X-ray. In heavy atoms that undergo electron capture, we expect what will come out of the atom to be characteristic X-rays. The characteristic X-ray occurs with iodine-123, which is a radioactive isotope that performs electron capture. It emits X-rays with an energy of 28 kilo electron volts and also emits gamma rays. As we mentioned with beta plus decay or regular decay, gamma rays of 160 kilo electron volts are also emitted. So if you have a machine that can detect the energies of the photons emitted and observe the energy spectrum of the photons coming from iodine-123, you will find two things. If you plot the energy on the x-axis and the emission or intensity on the y-axis, you will see the characteristic X-ray at 30 kV and the 160 kV corresponding to the gamma emitted from the nucleus. This is because it is related to the electron capture process. There is something called isomeric transition. We have talked about electron capture, beta minus decay, and beta plus decay. There is something called isomeric transition, and you need to understand it because the most common radioisotope used in nuclear medicine today is technetium TC99M. This beautiful one is not just any technetium. This is what we are working on today. Most tests usually use technetium. Of course, the beta decay uses F18, but I am talking about the regular spect in nuclear imaging. This is not just any technetium. Where does technetium come from? It comes from the decay of a substance called molybdenum. Where does molybdenum come from? It comes from the nuclear reactor. We will talk a bit more about the production related to nuclear materials. But I want you to understand that I call molybdenum the parent. Technetium is referred to as a daughter. Thus, when the material transforms from one element to another, the original parent element is molybdenum, and the resulting element is its daughter. For molybdenum to transform into technetium, a process called beta minus occurs, and gamma radiation is also emitted. It then transforms into technetium 99M, which is referred to as metastable meaning it is in a state of instability. It has not yet stabilized or reached its stable state. During this time, it transforms into another element with the same atomic number and mass number, which are called isomers because they are similar and related. Therefore, both have the same mass number and atomic number, 
with no difference in the atomic number, but technetium-99 was in. It was mentioned that there is a more stable state of technetium without the M, right? So, there are different energy states. Not only are there different energy states, but today, we also have different half-lives. Let's go back to the half-lives. Do you remember the topic of half-life? What is half-life? All right. So I have something to discuss about half-life, but let's clarify something first. We talked about the types of decay, and we discussed the isomeric one that emits gamma radiation. Just to clarify, before I move on, let's finish this. The calculation shows that it emits pure gamma radiation. You see, there is something here called 667, and I will explain that to you now. So, this is the gamma radiation that is emitted. And when the gamma photon comes out, it transforms. But before I get into the part about the half-life, there is something called internal conversion. What is internal conversion? The gamma photon that comes out while leaving the nucleus can collide with an electron. Okay, when does it collide with an electron? The electron is present in the shell. When can the gamma photon that comes out of the nucleus, doctors, eject the electron from its shell. It must be that the energy of the gamma photon is higher or close to the binding energy of the electron, right? So if the gamma photon is emitted with energy less than the binding energy of the electron, it will not be able to knock it out. Even if its energy is very high, the probability decreases. The probability decreases so its energy must be close to the binding energy. Remember the topic of the iodine and the dye, which is close to 33 kilo electron volts. The same idea, the same concept. This process that occurs is that a photon exits from the nucleus and an electron exits from its orbit. And consequently, an electron from a higher orbit comes to fill the gap that occurred in the shell, resulting in characteristic X-rays. I call this internal convergence. Internal convergence. Is that clear? Now remember the topic of the auger electron? Since we are on the subject, if the emitted X-ray hits an electron and knocks it out of its orbit, what do we call that electron? An auger electron, right? So we have connected everything. Internal convergence with the auger electron. Is that clear? So, as you might be aware, the beta that is emitted, if I have an isotope, does this emitted beta have a single energy? They said no. It actually has various different energy levels for the beta. Indeed. I am sorry. The average energy of the emitted beta is about one-third of the maximum energy of the beta. So I see this beta particle as the maximum energy of the beta particles that came out of the atom, and I want to get E, the average, which is one-third of the maximum energy. Now, as we said, when I talk about beta plus, the beta plus does ah, and it works and produces a value. The beta minus causes ionization of the atoms that are around it. An electron is also emitted until all the energy is released, meaning it starts to move in a way that is called tortuous, which is not a straight line. It doesn't move in a straight line anymore. It moves in a kind of tortuous motion, which is not a straight line for me. It begins to interact with the surrounding atoms until it loses all its energy in the environment or in the surroundings around it. Now, the distance it travels if it moves like this and stops at a point, 
I call this range. This distance is called range, which is the maximum distance a beta particle can travel. The maximum distance a beta particle can travel depends on its energy and the medium it is moving through. If the medium has high density or low density, if the energy of the beta particle is high, will the range be high or low? It will be high if the medium the beta particle is moving through has low density. The range remains high. May God open it up because if the density is high, then the number will increase and the probability of interactions will be complete with electrons, so all the energy will be spent over a short range. However, if the density is low, if the number is low, if the probability of interactions is low, then the range, or the distance it can travel, will be greater. All right, that's the beta particle. Now let's continue. This is regarding the positron we talked about. Okay, what about the two photon collectors? Of course, we will discuss this story in detail about what happens and how the process works in the PET CT, where it takes this photon and counts it here, and takes that photon and counts it on the other crystal. That's why the PET CT has this range. The range is structured like this. The entire detector caught one on the other side to do what? To detect a photon here and detect a photon there, we write to determine the exact location. We will discuss this in detail, God willing, when we talk about beta. Now this alpha particle is considered a helium atom, which is He4. This occurs with heavy particles, and it is essentially a heavy particle. The alpha particle itself loses all its energy in a very, very, very short range measured in micrometers. From the discussion I've had about alpha, beta, beta plus, and gamma. Gamma is the highest in penetration. I consider them as particles. I refer to them as if they are photons or waves, similar to X-rays. Gamma has properties similar to X-rays. X-rays can travel longer distances and can penetrate the patient's body and adjust the detector. The same idea applies to gamma rays, which I inject into the patient. They have the ability to penetrate the patient's body and reach my detector. But alpha and beta minus cannot do so because they lose all their energy inside the patient's body. That's why I use them in treatment. Today, nuclear radiotherapy is being used, such as lutetium, which is used in prostate cancer treatment. Lutetium is a beta emitter that targets tumors associated with prostate cancer or metastases related to it. Lutetium goes directly to the site of the metastasis and emits beta minus particles that treat cancer cells or destroy the existing cancer cells. The term PSMA refers to a chemical compound that binds to receptors found on the prostate, allowing lutetium to get closer to the cancer site. Consequently, lutetium can emit beta particles that can provide treatment. Okay, the positron is just like this beta emitter. The gamma is similar to the technetium that I work with in the imaging process or imaging operation. Of course, the alpha particle loses all its energy over a short range, and you can stop it with your hand or a piece of paper. The beta particles can be stopped with a sheet of aluminum, while gamma and X-rays require lead blocks to stop them. The alpha particle's ionization amount, along with the interactions that occur over a short range, is considered significant. The ionization density of gamma rays is considered low, meaning the amount of ionization or the knocking out of electrons present with the atoms and the interaction that occurs in a short range is considered low with beta and X-rays. Beta is generally higher than X-rays, but when comparing beta to alpha, beta is considered lower. Gamma can penetrate materials. For example, 
if there is paper, it won't stop it, while aluminum is needed to stop it. Alpha can be stopped by paper, but beta can pass through paper, although it can be stopped by aluminum. Okay, so I have an unstable atom with an excess number of protons, an excess number of neutrons, or whatever it is that made it unstable. It has transformed from being radioactive to stable, from unstable to stable, and the result of this conversion produced gamma, beta minus, beta plus, or whatever happened. Now, the decay that occurred, I call it the decay of conversion. This decay has a rate. If I say that I have one decay per second, what does that mean? It means that every second there is a disintegration or decay, meaning an unstable atom has become a stable atom. So gamma, beta, beta plus or alpha has been emitted as a result of this decay. One decay per second is what I call a Becquerel. That's my unit. So if I tell you that I have a, a radioactive element with a certain activity and its radioactive activity is one Becquerel, what does that mean? This means that every second, what happens is disintegration or decay. An unstable atom becomes a stable atom. This happens every second, which is completely understood. Now, the Becquerel, of course, refers to a radioactive isotope or a radioactive atom where one decay event does not occur every second, but rather millions of times per second. So, to make it easier for ourselves, they said, okay, when you say, for example, If I said, for example, ten to the power of six, for example, Becquerel, he told you to call it the Mega Becquerel. So you made it easier for yourself. Well, there was a unit they used, which is the old unit or the classic unit, and that unit is called Curie. One Curie is equal to three point seven times ten to the power of 10 disintegrations per second, or decay per second, or Becquerel, right? This is the unit for Curie, which is why you find the term strong degree still used today. Very few people use Becquerel, especially in Egypt. They might ask how many mega Becquerels, which is more common outside Egypt, but here we still use the Curie. When you say you have a certain number of Curies, you are referring to the activity in Curies. So if I say I have 10 Curies, 20 Curies, or 10 millicuries, you are talking about the number of disintegrations per second occurring in your material. Now, after a certain time, if your radioactivity was 1,000, for example, and after some time it reached 500, that means it was initially 1,000 disintegrations per second and is now 500 disintegrations per second, right? What does this mean? It means you have reached something called half-life, T-half, which is the time required for the amount of radioactive material to decrease by half, which is your T-half. The time for safety to free your active method to decrease by one half and lower T-half, yours, yours, yours. So after the half-life reaches 250, the second half-life, the third half-life, and so on, is fine. This is what I call half-life. I refer to it as physical half-life. What does physical mean? It is related to the radioactive material and has nothing to do with anything else. It is a property associated with the radioactive material, meaning every radioactive substance has a specific half-life, like technetium. When we were talking here, for example, you see this blue color which represents stable materials. After a certain time, you find that they all turn red. Look, this is the curve. I'm sorry for always confusing you with the colors I use. This amazing blue represents the decay. Look, it keeps decreasing, 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 decreasing red, which is okay. The red one represents the number of what was formed, and the blue one 
represents the number of what is left, the one that decreases or the one that is still present. That's absolutely correct, without a doubt. This is what I call the physical half-life. So, as I mentioned, if I say, for example, that the physical half-life of technetium is six hours, the parent molybdenum has a half-life of 67 hours, to be precise. FDG 150 minutes, iodine 1.3.1, 8 days. There are elements, I mean, I want to tell you about technetium 99 miminum. Technetium decays. We are here with technetium 99 without M. The two are isomers of each other. I mean, I want to tell you about that. What happens to the technetium-99 if we say it without the two? What is that? It has a decay or a half-life of approximately 200,000 years. Who is this element? It's technetium, known as technetium-99. You know, when you injected the patient with technetium-99, it means that after the patient was injected with technetium-99, do you remember this equation? Here it is. 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 Ruthenium will undergo decay, emitting beta and gamma radiation, and it has a decay period of 200,000 years. Do you think that this technetium present means that the patient is constantly exposed to beta particles and gamma radiation inside their body? Does the long half-life of 200,000 years mean that the patient will die? while their body is still decaying and there is still technetium in their system. Am I right or wrong? Right, that's what I'm saying, right? So the question here is, does this pose any danger to the patient? No. Why? I honestly don't know. But its energy is low. Its energy is low. Oh, the thrill! and excitement are truly overwhelming. Oh, 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 what a moment. Am I saying 200,000 years, right? Is that correct? All right then, so if I have, for example, I injected 10 millicuries. It will remain in the human body. Let's assume, hypothetically, and millicurie. Because of those 10 millicuries, the substance is excreted through urine, leading to what is called biological half-life. This means that a portion of the radioactive material is excreted through urine and the excreta which represents the biological half-life, indicating the exit of the substance from the biological system of the patient. Right. Now, there is a physical part related to the decay of the substance. I have technetium, Tc, with a radioactive strength of one millicurie. Do you know what its half-life is? It's 200,000 years, which means that after 200,000 years, it will be 0 0.5 millicurie. So, its rate of decay is slow, not fast, very slow. If there are beta particles and gamma radiation emitted, can you imagine their frequency being slow or fast? Very slow. Therefore, the hazard level for you will be very low. That's why when you have a radioisotope with a fast half-life, it's like giving a high dose in a short time like with FDG. If you extend the FDG to the patient, what is the half-life of FDG? 
two hours to 10 minutes. 